morning, Gospel Hope. Good morning. I feel like a little bit like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, I have not been clicking my heels, but there is no place like home. Uh, it's good to be back. Haven't have been away for a few, um, but uh, nevertheless, like I said, it is always an honor and a pleasure to be back here and serve um, the family of God locally. Um, as you know, we are in our series entitled uh, Forward uh, in Faith, Forward in Faith. And um, as we um, move forward in faith in so many different regards, uh, for those of you that may be visiting with us, greetings to you. Uh, for those of you that are um, right here at home, you know that one of the things that we are trying to trust God for is, uh, uh, is his, his momentum, his help, and his solutions as we move forward in a merger, if you will. Um, many people have been afraid of that word. And uh, I remember one of the things that I uh, learned from the marketplace many years ago was to celebrate the small wins whenever you were driving institutional change. That is, when you see these seeming moments that don't represent the touchdown, but they represent first downs uh, or, or singles or whatever they call it in soccer. Uh, a single is not soccer. I'm just trying to run the gamut of sports just in case, I, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, if you're a chef, you know, maybe like, uh, I don't know, the initial wafting of, of goodness from the oven before it's time to pull it all the way open. I don't know, but just wherever you are, there are small wins that need to be celebrated in any uh, thing. And I just praise God for small wins that I see among us as a, um, as a congregation. Um, I look forward to what God is doing beyond the legal and the logistics and the strategic and how it is that he is not uh, just helping us with a merger, but how he is building a marriage, which is the coming together of two people formerly estranged, knowing nothing about one another, but yet knit together forever. I'm looking forward to that and, and his design for what he wants to do uh, in these two churches for whatever duration uh, he so desires. And so. Uh, we need God's help in all of it, but I need God's help in particular in preaching this morning, and you need his help in hearing uh, more than just the voice of a man. We all want to hear the voice of the Lord, do we not? Let's ask him. Um, Father, in the name of Jesus, we believe that the adventure of preaching was not created by human beings, but it was your development. You, cr you crafted it, you created it, and you gifted the body with those who have the abilities to do so. But not just abilities as man would call them, Lord God. You give supernatural enablement to that moment when it is done in obedience. And so as we look at the text this morning, would you please take hold of our hearts, aim at us appropriately, show us ourselves in the mirror of your word, show us our world through the window of your word, so that all the things that lay against our lives, we can effectively manage and navigate them through your truths. We need you in this way most desperately. Lord God, I need you this morning. Uh, beyond what has been written down, I have no desire to be a news reporter, but to be a herald of what you are saying. Would you use me or move me out of the way, whatever is the appropriate move? Uh, would you, Lord God, unstuff our ears, deliver us from our preferences or our prejudices to want to hear certain things but not hear others? Would you give us a clear demonstration of your spirit as is promised by the scriptures if we would focus squarely on the knowledge of Jesus Christ and him crucified? Lord God, there's nothing, there's no such thing as putting too much on your plate. And so, Lord God, we hand this and all of our other requests over to you and ask that you would be with us this morning as we need you desperately in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the title of this morning's message is Fast Forward or Rewind. Fast Forward or Rewind. Forward or Rewind. Fast Forward or Rewind. You know, as I think about what we're doing here um, as a local church, there might be times when you feel like you are really moving forward or you're moving forward really fast. And I believe that this is a dynamic that happens all the time in the believer's life. We are a very hurried culture. Uh, and I blame in part the inventor of the VCR. Uh, in the early 1980s, uh, the, the invention of the VCR gave us in our homes a unique capacity that we had never experienced before. Several things. Number one, the ability to finally own and capture our own delights when it came to entertainment, a VHS tape, right? Our, our, our movies, our shows, we, we, we could finally own them and watch them at our leisure. But the VCR that they go in also came with certain capabilities, and that is to record. We could now capture while we were away at work our favorite shows that previously we had missed. Maybe we were out on some other type of exercise and we just had to catch updates from other folks that we work with in order to know what happened on our favorite show. But the VCR solved that problem for us. 
But in giving us the great blessing of being able to capture these moments and hold them all for our own and to record these moments, it also equipped us with another blessing that is also a quasi-burden for today. Uh, One of those blessings are the buttons, fast forward and rewind. You see, the fast forward and rewind button obviously gives us the ability on the VCR and even on today's modern remotes to simply simply skip past the particulars and the, the things that we believe have gotten in the way of the real big story. And and we can go back later if we want to, but for the most part, fast forward has allowed us as a culture to look at certain things and say, that right there is non-essential. Let me get to the heart of the issue. Let me get to the meat of my show. And I don't need to watch that again. I believe that the fast forward rewind culture lives very heavily in even the way we read our Bibles. I mean, come on. How many people here are already familiar with the story of Abraham? How many of you probably... Uh, wish that we would just fast forward to the good stuff. Now, what's interesting is that in each one of our hearts, there's probably a different place in Abraham's story that represents the good stuff. And so in our hearts and minds, even as I'm preaching, you've intellectually and emotionally have got your finger on the fast forward button said, can we even get past your introduction? I don't need your preacher commercial. Can you feel it? There'll be a point where, and and, and I'm going to tell you this, because it is embedded in our culture and we are pregnant with, we are saturated with the fast forward rewind ideals, we also do it in our devotional lives. We read the book of the, we read the Bible looking for the hot nuggets, the quotables, the memes, the things that we can put in our Facebook status. We look for the stuff that's, that's Facebook or, or, or t-shirt ready, bumper sticker style. We look for promises and the hot takes fast forward in our hearts and maybe miss some of the nice details. This is important because I believe that in today's passage of scripture, I want to equip us to fight the temptation to fast forward. Because when we fast forward through the story of God, whether it be his word or even in our own lives, we try to fast forward through his will, we will indefinitely, or excuse me, we will indubitably end up needing to rewind to see his actual character. And that's the point of today's message. When we attempt to fast forward the will of God, we will always have to rewind to really be reminded of his character. As we're looking at the evolution or the development, the unpacking of the Abrahamic covenant here, which is just super paramount and fundamental to the life of the believer and your understanding of the Old Testament and God's people and where they come from and how you fit within the grand narrative, right? There are some particulars and details that I don't want us to miss, four of them in particular. As we look at uh, Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, I'm going to read them for us nice and slow and then come back and tell you how it is that we're going to safeguard our hearts from fast-forwarding through the will of God in our lives, fast-forwarding through his word, and being forced to go back and rewind to capture his character. Let's read together. Or I'll read and you just kind of listen to whatever it is you do when preachers are listening, when reading. Genesis chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Some of your Bibles may say, I am your shield and I am your reward. Both translations work for today's message, and I'll see why in just a moment. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, but Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eleazar. Notice he didn't say, how will you be my shield? He said, what will you give me? He's already experienced a little bit of God as a shield because in the previous passage or the message that you heard last week, you saw Abram go into battle to rescue Lot, and he was successful in that campaign. He kind of knows that God is a protector, but he doesn't know him fully, and this is why God chooses to reintroduce himself, and this will make more sense in just a moment. Abram goes on in his rebuttal to God's promise to be a shield and a reward. He says, and Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring and the member of my household will be uh, 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 my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. 
These four ideas that I hope you will rewind in today's text and see concerning the character of God are as follows. God is our shield. God is our reward. God is our justifier. And God is our clarifier. I believe that all four of these are laying readily right on the surface of today's text and in some other places, maybe just a skosh beneath, but we'll get there together. God is our shield, reward, justifier, and clarifier. Why do we need to know these things? Well, if you rush through the story of Abraham, you, in, in pursuit of seeing the promises unpacked, you miss these details concerning the person of God and his character. And I believe God wants us to slow down and see them. Well, let's look at the first one. In the very first verse, God says, I am your shield, or I will be your shield. I am your shield. Why does God say this? I believe that in light of what's happening in Abram's life in this very moment, the reason that the Lord says, I am your shield, is this. He wants to show that he both knows the, oppo he knows the opponents to our obedience. I mean, a shield is a defensive mechanism. He wants to make it clear that he knows the opponents to our obedience. Any initiative that God calls us on, whether it just be to live right, live holy, take a certain job, enter into marriage, uh, to stop doing certain things, to start doing certain things, anything that God calls us to do will feature opposition for two reasons. Number one, we have an adversary who is roaming back and forth looking for whom he might devour, who wants to steal, kill, and to destroy, who wants to thumb his nose at God, who wants to undermine his glory, who wants to usurp God's position, and if he can't do it on the throne, he wants to do it on the throne of our hearts. We have an opponent to God's will every single day of the week. And so God, as he's calling any of us to do anything, says, I am your shield. I will protect you from that external work. Or as uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 puts it, little children, you are from God uh, and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. I would like to offer the RSV version of that, which is the rod standard version, which is this. Not only is he greater than the things, the greater is he than in me than is what is in the world, but greater is he that is in me than the sum total of my collective worries. Because Abram not only had foes to following through on what God called him to do, he also had fears. And so often we may not see the, you know, the man in the devil horned costume with the, with the fresh pitchfork rampaging through our lives, our biggest issues and obstacles and opponents to obedience may be personal hangups that we have, like the ones that Abraham raised before God, the God of heaven and earth, and that's how he worshiped the Lord with Melchizedek. He just worshiped the Lord with Melchizedek, that he is the God of heaven and earth in the previous chapter, and here we are just a few verses later lamenting to the Lord what he lacks and that he does not have an heir. How can you be my reward and I don't have the things that I believe I need to follow through on this promise that you've made? This isn't just Abraham's issue, it is also my issue. God is our shield. I've got internal opposition to obedience and I've got external opposition. The devil for sure. The Bible assures me that in Christ, the devil and his antics have been dealt with. Jesus is raised in victory, not just as some kind of ta-da, but he's been raised in victory over sin, death, and the devil, the trifecta of things that would seek to undermine every believer's life. If you are in Christ, you are not only beneficiaries, but you are, you are participants in the active victory over Satan, the opponent to your obedience, no matter what it is that God has called you to do. But at the same time, we need God's work to overcome our internal fears to following through on his great work. Uh, my son uh, and I were talking on the phone uh, just this week. He had had a Zoom call with his academic advisor, signing up for his very first year of college classes and um, trying to reconcile how to have the right classes in light, light of his very lofty baseball schedule and all of the training that they will require of him. And so after he got off the phone with them, he called me and we reviewed his schedule just a bit. And it was this little moment that I got a chuckle because I kind of saw a glimpse of the gospel and God's even own work in this conversation. My son was going through the classes that he has and he goes, oh, and dad, this class right here, 
He was like, I was in some sort of a conundrum. I didn't know which class to take. And my advisor said, take this one because I'm not only your academic advisor, but for this class, I'll also be your professor. I believe that that is illustrative of even God's call in our life. You know, God isn't just calling us to some rigorous matriculation and, and, and just say, take this, take this, do this, learn that, and follow through and execute on this. He says, I, I'm not just your advisor. I'm also your instructor. I'm there in the crucible with you. That is, I believe that little minette, I believe that's just a little view of how God even works in our lives. Because the problems, here's what I want you to understand, is that, that, that God wants us to know that he is our God, not just our tour guide. He isn't just a God who just told Abram to go on this lofty adventure to which he'll give him sequential details along the way. He's not just his guide saying do this or do that, calling plays. He is also his God. And I believe God wants us to feel that and know that too. And that's why these clear character introductions are necessary. Because if all of I thought of the Christian life was just to execute on the initiatives before me without getting to know the God who has called me to them, that's not really the life that God has called us to. Real can recognize this. I want to completely revamp your view of problems. Um, the problems that we encounter in the pursuit of God's will are just platforms of continual reintroduction. The problems that we encounter in life, whatever problem you are facing, no matter what its duration, no matter its depth, no matter its degree of difficulty, I can assure you whatever problem you are encountering is designed to be a platform of divine reintroduction. You know me because you read about me in Sunday school. You know me, you grew up in a Christian home. You know me because you've at least been here for one or two of these message series. You know me, you've read tracks at a restaurant. You know me, you've read a Bible in a hotel drawer. You know a little bit about me, but let me officially reintroduce myself in a capacity that you might have missed. All of your problems are platforms of divine reintroduction. And no level of education or devotion prepares you for them. There is a level of understanding of God's word that I absolutely need because I need to be able to connect the dots between what the text says and what the Lord is showing. So I'm not trying to, I'm not elevating experience over exposition. But what I am clearly saying is we all think we know God because we have memorized a few attributes and laid hold of a couple of promises. But the Lord says, I, there's some problems I want to help you navigate through. And this will be this, it'll be in that problem that I will officially reintroduce myself to you. God is your shield. Did that take me about 20 minutes? Because that means we got about 80 minutes of message left. <laughs> Whew. All right. That's what happens when you guys have me away for a while. All right. Let's look at verses 2 through 4. It won't be that bad, I promise. I'll, I'll try. Uh, but, but Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and my heir, and the heir of my house, Eleazar, is Eleazar, Eleazar of Damascus. I don't have any offspring so the closest thing that I have to an heir. Now, this is a problem for, for Abram as, as he's listening to God promise. God promised him that he'll be his reward. He's like, what could you possibly give me to fill in this massive cratering blank in my life? Love it. You've helped me in this war campaign. You've shown me some clear things in other parts of the adventure. But the one thing that I need from you, God, you hadn't solved that problem yet. I believe that God is a rewarder and he is our reward. But he rewards and blesses us in a way that does this or drives this idea home. The Lord wants us to know, or he wants to know, he wants to know, and for us to clearly see, that we should want him more than anything else that he has to offer. God always had it up his sleeve if God wears sleeves. sleeves. I like to envision him as maybe like a, a wife beater or maybe just with his shirt completely off to show off his um, omnipotence. But if God, if God really has this plan for, for Abram, if he really has this plan, he's like, well, well if you really are a rewarder, where is my reward? Because I have a reward in mind, and I just haven't gotten it yet. The Lord, the Lord wants to know that we want him more than, he, than anything that he has to offer. This could not be typified more in, in anyone's life than that of the life of Abram, who is eventually called to sacrifice Isaac. And the Lord stays his hand because the Lord says, okay, now I know you want me, then you want a son. 
I don't believe that that exercise or that curriculum of, of, of can I have your biggest blessing or would you rather have your blessing or would you rather have me? I don't believe that that curriculum is exclusive to Abram. I believe for every single one of us that's got something in our lives, we have a place or a way that we would desire to be blessed and the Lord either is delaying or de he's either delaying the blessing or developing us to be able to handle it so that we will not want it more than we want him. Eleazar, the heir apparent, but not the one that God has chosen, his name means God helps. That's a true statement. I believe in all of our lives, God wants to continuously, as I say it, reintroduce himself in ways or help us to, to know certain things about him, help him to love him. Eliezer's name means God is our, our help. Ishmael's name, who he will conceive later in his own strength, is God hears. But Isaac's name means God laughs. Not in a jokey ha-ha way, but that God laughs at every ounce of opposition that would ever stand up and say that he can't accomplish the impossible. Abraham and Sarah both were well beyond advanced maternal age, not able to have children scientifically, biologically, any way you slice it. This was not supposed to be possible in their lives. And God laughed at that opposition, and God wants to laugh at the opposition in your life too. He wants it to be this massive blessing that reeks of his glory, that shines of his glory in your life. But why? Why does God bless? I think there's three reasons why God blesses. Number one, I believe God blesses, God blesses to increase our capacity to serve him. The blessing of a son isn't just so that Sarah can finally have the shower that she wanted or the gender reveal that she can post on social media. The blessing of Isaac was so that they would both be able to multiply and out of them would come this people that would be God's own select people that would eventually translate to a people not of, ge uh, uh, of, of genetic uh, um, um, type, but a, but a people that would result in you and I, a kind of people that would trust God in faith. So, so a blessing is designed to increase our capacity to serve God. That's what Isaac would do. He would increase their capacity Number two, a blessing, if it really is a blessing and not something that we're just consuming upon our lust, because we can try to do that, but if it's really a blessing, it'll increase my capacity to serve, but it'll also increase my confidence in the one that I am serving. I mean, you had better believe that Sarah, who previously smirked and chuckled at the prospect that God would cause her to have a child, would never smirk in that way again. I mean, in her very body, God gave the testimony that he could overcome the impossible. Do you believe that there's any other obstacles uh, uh, that, 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 that they came into contact with that they couldn't just laugh at and say, well, if God did this, I know he can do that. Blessings increase my capacity to serve, and it increases my confidence in the one that I am serving. And number three, it should also increase my commitment to showcase the glory of God to others to share with others. Look at this child that he gave us when we couldn't have one. Look at this thing that is so enormous and, and crazy this, that in my life. Only the God of heaven and earth could do this. The, the blessings of God should put us in a position where, where people see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. That's the design, that's the DNA of a blessing. I don't wanna hear about no 0% financing on some truck. God is your rewarder and your reward. He's the one who gives a reward, but he's also the reward. That's the principal thing. I believe, I think it's fair to say, in light of the way I see God working in Abram's life, that the Lord will target our deficiency in order to teach us his all-sufficiency. Certainly the God of heaven and earth, who knows all things and sees all things, knew that when he approached Abram in this way, that Abram would throw up these two flags. I don't have any offspring. How is this going to work? I believe the Lord targets, not in a torturing way, but he targets our deficiencies so that we can see his all-sufficiency. Otherwise, we just think God helped us a little bit. We just think we needed a little bit of a push, but the rest of it was really us. No, no, we need him always, in all means. He has to be the all-sufficient God in our lives. And he teaches that by targeting 
our deficiencies. The New Testament bears out this reality in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when it says that Paul three times sought the Lord to remove the thorn from his side. And it it says, the Lord said to him, nah, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast in the, I will boast more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. There is something pivotal There's a pivotal power point in God when my deficiencies have been officially exposed and I have to go before God and experience his all-sufficiency in that area. Do not shy away from insurmountable problems. Don't hide them. Don't live a life that lacks vulnerability because you're embarrassed about what you cannot do. Because you cannot do it, but let God be the one who does. Verses 5 and 6. And he brought Abraham outside. This is awesome. And he brought Abraham outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. I believe the Lord not only is our shield and our reward, but he is also our justifier. He is our just justifier. What do I mean? You'll see in just a moment. The Lord wants to not only show that he knows the opponents of our obedience, or let us know, he not only wants to know that we love him and desire him more than anything he would bless us with, but I think he also wants to grow. He wants to grow our faith well beyond our felt need. Where do we get this from? He's having a dialogue with, with, with Abram in his tent, and when Abram consistently points out what he lacks, the Lord calls him outside the tent and says, look up. You see, lack will cause us to look out, but the Lord causes us to look up. Our lack causes us to look out to see what we have or don't have in contrast to others. In the ancient Near East, it would have been quite the indictment to be a man with much possession, but no real heirs, if you will, to hand them off to. So Abram is tempted to look at what he lacks rather than to look up as the Lord would call him to. And when he looks up, the Lord says, can you number the stars? No. Now, Rick, now, now, in this moment, Abram recognizes that this idea of having a son is a singular blessing that has seismic implications well beyond anything that he and Sarah could have ever hoped for. He isn't just giving them a child. He is going to literally change the trajectory of redemptive history. Whatever God blesses you with, trust me, it is always, while it is for you, it is always bigger than you. He is the justifier. But what do I mean by he is the justifier? I believe that the Lord uses our immediate needs as a segue to our ultimate need. He uses immediate needs as a segue to our ultimate need. You see, the immediate need that is seen by Abram is the lack of a son. But there is an ultimate need, and that is that he needs a relationship with an all holy and righteous God. I believe that this is kind of a, 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 an Old Testament appetizer to the doctrine of justification, whereby we are justified by faith. He was, he was, he was, he, he was told, he was, it was counted to him as righteousness. He was imputed a, statue, a, a, a status of righteousness, not based on Abram's past performance because he is an idol worshiper out of the Ur Chaldees. Not based on his present qualifications because he's won a couple of wars. He can't even have kids, and not because of his future prospects. In other words, your past, your present, and your future offer no qualifiers for righteousness. The only thing that, if you will, resulted in a gracious imputation of a status of righteousness in this relationship was that he believed God at his word based on what he had said. Such is the DNA of even your salvation. You may not be an Old Testament citizen, but you had to believe God and take him at his word. Believe what he said about the work of his son on the cross. And then you, if you believe that, you were considered righteous. Christ became your righteousness. Your status was changed. You were justified. You were made qualified to receive the blessing of God. You didn't qualify yourself. Uh, My heart is dear to this particular passage because the Hebrew word for he believed is the word aman. Yeah, 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 for those of you that are visiting, that's my son's name, Amon. Yeah. So, he is the justifier. But let me say this about the things that we lack. 
Um, when you're acutely focused on the immediate, you lose focus of the ultimate. And this is one of the great games of Satan. It's when our lives are inundated with a hyper-focus on the things that we don't have to get the will of God done. We lose, we lose the view of his ultimate character. We look at what God has said in his word and, almost as, and, and we talk back to him as if it was an indictment. And none of us would ever turn our mouths, some of us would never turn our mouths toward heaven and say, God, you didn't do this and didn't do that. But if you raise up off your knees or stand up from your chair or close your Bible after your devotions, be like, well, that was cute, but I don't know if that's my word because it doesn't seem to scratch your current immediate itch. You're doing the same thing. You're offering the promises of God a rebuttal based on your current circumstances. Our immediate need should be a segue into our ultimate need. The New Testament tells us that no one has ever sought after God on their own. He has to draw by his grace. The Bible goes on to say that we have all fallen short of the standard. None of us, regardless of how hard and heartily, we might be aiming at the standard of God. We all fall short. And then it is God himself by his grace who qualifies, who justifies us. This isn't just the ideas surrounding execution on God's will. It, it, whatever he calls us to do, he'll also equip us to do. But it isn't just for that. It's also the larger story of our own salvation. I would imagine that, that, that for people here who are authentically and genuinely saved, who would who would who would dry heave at the prospect of saying that they have a, a works theology, but the way we execute on God's will does seem as if we have a works theology because we believe that too much of it is dependent on us. Was that insulting? No? Thank you, Ryan. The last uh, set of passages that I want to read is here in verses 18 through 21. Fast forward to the end of the chapter. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your offspring, I will give this land from the river of Egypt, the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kizanites, the Kizites, the Camdenites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephim, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Now, what's interesting about this additional clarity and specificity that God is giving is I believe that this is an important move to know God as our clarifier. Because in previous conversations, in, 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 in previous disclosures of God's will, the Lord was not this specific. He, he would say when he separated from Lot, hey, look north, south, east, and west. This is the land that I'll give to you. In, in prior to that, he would just say, go to a land that I will show you. But notice that as he obeys God, the, 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 the coordinates of what God is going to do become more clear. But not just the coordinates. If you read all of chapter 15, you'll note that not only has the Lord now assigned the names of people groups who, might, who will be occupying this land prior to him giving it to his people. So he's told them, this is the map, this is the people, this is the place. But in a prior passage, he says, and also... You're going to live in Egypt and be under duress. You're going to be in bondage. But don't worry about it. I got your back. I am your shield and I am your reward. You see, the Lord is now providing additional clarity. But why is this clarification necessary? I believe that the Lord wants to give us enough detail to equip us, but not enough to cripple us. How many people know that we live in an information age and in a society where we can often be paralyzed and crippled by too much information? The moment we get a little bit, we, 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 just in, we have an insatiable appetite for more. And we want to know. We go to our Googles. We go to different places. Or even we go to the Lord. It's like, all right, tell me more. And the Lord is saying, listen, I, I've given you enough to be faithful. Follow through on that, and then I'll give you what's next. There are two tendencies, I believe, that live in this room, and maybe some of us that are on the spectrum. There are those who accelerate, try to accelerate through God's will. You get a little bit of something from God, and you run ahead of him because you're aggressive, and there are others of you who, who perpetually hesitate because you just if then yourself to death. Well, what if this happens? What if then this, if, if that, that? And so the Lord, to rescue all of us, gives us enough information to equip but not to cripple because he doesn't want us to he hesitate and he doesn't want us to move ahead of him. He wants us to walk in sync with him. Here's why. Um, some of you may go to your car angry after this, but I'm okay with that. Just go straight to your car. Don't come see me and don't email me. <laughs> I don't believe that the Lord is trying to give us a blueprint for our best life now. 
I believe that the Lord is trying to give us a roadmap for our best relationship now. The reason that we don't get all the details is because the Lord isn't trying to give you this blueprint where you can just set it and forget it, and you're going to build what you, the dream life you've been, desi- you've been desiring. He sequentially unfolds pieces of the story where you can focus on his character because he isn't trying to help you build your best life now, but he is trying to invite you into a roadmap where as you follow him, you discover your best relationship with the Lord for now and forevermore. And therefore, we don't always get the answers to the test on the front end. Finally, I think this is my first close, isn't it? First no close, I'll do it. I got four more closes. Finally, um, I think we should know this, that whatever the Lord has made clear up to this point is enough for us to steer. Whatever difficulties we have, whatever the Lord has made clear is more than enough to steer through the terrain that we currently have. If we, if we could learn that from Abram's life, whatever he had given him at that moment was enough based on his internal fears and his external opposition, based on the assignment, based on his tendencies to be an accelerator or a hesitator. Whatever God has made clear at this point is enough for you to steer at this point. Be faithful in that and stop begging for more. The Lord will, if you, if you obey God, Jesus said in John chapter 14, that if you'll obey him, me and the Father will come and make our abode with you. When you obey God, he sets up appointments. He's like, all right, it's time for you to get clarity on the next phase of life, the next phase of your assignment. And so with that, I want to urge us not to be people who try to fast forward through God's will. Because it isn't a blueprint designed to help you discover and build your best life now. It's not about you. It is about relationship with him. I hope that you can have a reversal in that paradigm as you're thinking about God's will and and whatever you're going through in your life. But even in that, I hope that as you discover various deficits, immediate needs, that they would always apprise you and inform you of your ultimate need, which is your need for Jesus Christ and for more of him. I need to be constantly reintroduced to the very Lord that I knelt to and confessed to as a little boy. I need constant reintroduction. And I think anybody else that knows themselves and knows their hearts well and believes in the truths of Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, you need some constant reintroduction as well. I would love for you to join me in just a time of prayer. As we bow our heads, I'd like to get us formally reintroduced. Father God, you know all of the needs that are in the room. You know the the will and the trajectory for our lives that we have shared as as a congregation, as well as you know the shared trajectory or the individual trajectories that we have as individual people. You know the assignments, the craters, the potholes, the loopholes, You know how, you know the temptations that the adversary has crafted for each one of our lives. You know our tendencies to be a hesitator or an accelerator. You understand and know all those things. I pray for the person in the room who has been hesitating on on coming to you in faith because they don't know all the details of Christianity. They're waiting for you to give them this ultimate and absolute clarity to all of their questions before they come out of their agnosticism or their functional atheism or just their sitting on the sidelines of religion. I pray, oh God, that you would speak to that person today to say that you don't owe them clarity. Your word says, who has known the mind of the Lord that you, that we might instruct him, but we do have the mind of Christ. So you do have information available for us, oh God, and you've given us enough to steer. I pray for that person that's trying to navigate, Lord God, life without you, that you are speaking to them right now, that this is their language. It's something that, Lord God, that that Holy Spirit, you are delivering mail to their box right now to say, open this. This was just for you. Will you trust me even though you don't have the completed story? If you're that person today, I pray that you you are asking the Lord to save you, to come into your heart, to rescue you from your sin. I pray for that for you if you're out there and you're thinking about your immediate need. You're like, I, I don't need salvation. I need, I need a solution to this immediate thing. Your immediate need is intended to point you to your ultimate need. You need a God who rules heaven and earth and wants to sit on the throne of your heart. Lord God, would you speak to that person? 
Would you speak to the person, Lord God, who's been roaming around the periphery of your will and knows that they need to be a part of a local church? That is a place where, where they need the levels of accountability and opportunity to, to serve and vulnerability and transparency and connectivity that they need. They know they need it, but they, are, they have been hurt. I pray, oh God, that you are addressing those wounds. But as you address those wounds, you remind them that you are their shield and their reward. You'll protect them and keep them. But what they're really warring with is a fear of being hurt again in themselves. Oh God, would you just resurrect that person's appreciation for the local church? I pray for the person that is struggling mightily in some area of their lives, whether it is a repeat sin that has been on rewind and replay in their lives since they, the time that they were a teenager and they cannot seem to shake its grip. I pray for that person that is in their desire to, to, to rush to the next life that doesn't include this addiction or doesn't include this difficulty that you would cause them to rewind and see your character. And the reason that that sin is repeated in their life is because they've just tried to do repentance from a secular perspective, stopping the behavior, but they have not started to trust the God who died to free them from that behavior. Lord God, would you speak, speak to the room. Lord God, we can stand here all day appealing to you and asking you for things, but your word promises that you have given us the Holy Spirit who prays for us because we don't know the things to ask for as we ought to. I pray that you would just meet the people in the room where they are. Call them to come forward. In Jesus' name I pray. I said come forward. You don't necessarily have to come down to the altar and see me, but I would like to, just anybody, if you, if, if my personality is too over the top, go see somebody else a little less aggressive or chatty. But go see somebody. Talk to somebody. Uh, don't leave here without being prayed with, prayed for, talking to one of the pastors, or just a mature believer in the body, if that spoke to you. I pray that during our time of worship that you would speak to the Lord and, and let him just meet you at the place of your immediate need, showing you also your ultimate need. Amen. Let's worship him.